Hello, I'm Marco Davis, President and CEO of the Congressional Hispanic Caucus Institute. Welcome to CHCI's 2023 Capitol Hill Briefing Series. This series is the culmination of CHCI's premier nine-month postgraduate fellowship program, which offers exceptional Latinos from throughout the country unparalleled hands-on experience working in public policy here in Washington, D.C. This unique fellowship program seeks to enhance participants' leadership abilities, strengthen their professional skills, and increase the presence of Latinos in public policy areas, this year specifically in the areas of health, technology, housing, education, and the environment. CHCI is thrilled to offer our postgraduate fellows the opportunity to share their perspectives on policy issues they're passionate about and convene leaders in this work for an informative conversation. We'd like to thank our postgraduate fellowship program sponsors, whose support for the program is invaluable. The sponsors include Meta, the PepsiCo Foundation, America's Health Insurance Plans, the Walton Family Foundation, Bristol Myers Squibb, Microsoft, DaVita, Wells Fargo, and CVS Health. During and after today's session, you can keep this important conversation going and broaden the number of people engaged by using the hashtag CHCI Fellows on social media. We hope that you will. To learn more about our postgraduate fellowship program, as well as our other leadership programs and special events, please visit chci.org. And we encourage you to reach out to our fellows directly via LinkedIn to learn more about their policy topic and also please help them connect with job opportunities for when their program concludes in May. Thanks so much for joining us. And now, enjoy the discussion. Hello, my name is Caroline Gonzalez Scott and I'm Vice President of Programs at CHCI. I'm excited to be giving introductory remarks for such an important issue that has captured so much attention since the onset of the pandemic and how Hispanic Americans have served on the front lines as healthcare workers. Just this week, the U.S. Census Bureau released results showing how people who identify as being of Hispanic or Latino origin self-reported their race in the 2020 census and there were major shifts in race reporting within the Hispanic population compared to the 2010 census. Latinos continue to be one of the largest racial or ethnic groups, representing 18.9% of the total U.S. population, and by 2060, the Latino population is projected to make up 28% of the U.S. population. However, the U.S. health workforce is not keeping pace with this population growth, and for this reason, we must take action to create ways for more Latinos to enter the health professions requiring advanced education. A lot of research has shown that physicians who speak the same native language and can relate to the cultural experiences of their patients have been linked to better patient outcomes. Over the last few years, there have been increasing bipartisan support in Congress to improve the diversity of the health workforce such as the Allied Health Workforce Diversity Act, the Physician Shortage Graduate Medical Education Cap Flex Act, and the Resident Physician Shortage Reduction Act. I am now pleased to introduce CHCI's Bristol Myers Squibb Health Graduate Fellow, Indira Islas, who will be moderating this important panel, A Journey to Better Health, Advancing Latinos in the Health Workforce. Thank you, Caroline, for that wonderful introduction. And good morning, buenos dias, everyone. My name is Indira Islas, and as was mentioned, I am the CHCI BMS Graduate Fellow. I'd like to start off by thanking CHCI for allowing me this opportunity and to Bristol-Myers Squibb for their support of the fellowship. I'm so excited to be moderating this wonderful panel titled A Journey to Better Health, Advancing Latinos in the Health Workforce. I'm also pretty thrilled to be speaking on a topic that I started to explore while in graduate school and one that has grown to be a passion of mine as I will soon be applying to medical school. I would also like to dedicate the work that went into this briefing to my parents who are both doctors in Mexico and who sacrificed their professions 
so that I could have a better life here in the U.S. Now, unfortunately, due to some barriers, they were not able to continue practicing as doctors here. But from a young age, I was able to witness the beautiful profession that is medicine. So, a mis papás que están viendo, esto es para ustedes. Now, when we talk about the need to advance more Latinos in the health workforce, this requires a cross-sector collaboration and a multifaceted approach. But before we dive into how we can go about doing this, I'd first like to start by sharing some important facts to set the stage for our conversation. One, it is that the leading cause of death for Latinos includes cancer, heart disease, stroke, and diabetes. And in addition to this, Latinos are also less likely to have health insurance compared to white Americans and other minority groups. Two, according to an analysis of government data, just 7% of all Latinos insurgents are Latino, and just 9% of all healthcare practitioners and technicians are Latino, while almost one in five Americans are Latino. Three, deficiencies in the healthcare workforce pose a significant threat to addressing health disparities and the health system's ability for the Latino population and other minorities especially given their significant projected growth in the U.S. population. So for these reasons, it is important that the U.S. have a health workforce that is more accurately, accurately reflective of the Latino population and one that is culturally competent. And lastly, it is also equally important to keep in mind that the Latino population is not monolithic, and there are also variations in health, educational, and cultural patterns between the Latino subgroups. And so with this, I look forward to having a meaningful conversation with our panelists. And I'm also excited for this panel for a couple of reasons. One, it is that I met two of our panelists, whom I'll introduce in a second, Dr. Rios and Dr. Cordero, about a year ago from today at the National Hispanic Medical Association Conference, where I presented, where I presented on this exact same topic. And lastly, I wanted to thank and recognize Ed Salzberg, a former colleague when I worked at the Mullen Institute for Health Works Equity while in graduate school and who supported my research on this topic. And now without further ado, I'd like to start by introducing our panelists and then we'll give them a few minutes to uh, give some remarks. Uh, Dr. Elena Rios serves as president and CEO of the National Hispanic Medical Association representing 50,000 Hispanic physicians in the U.S. The mission of the organization is to improve the health of Hispanics. Dr. Rios also serves as president of NHMA's National Hispanic Health Foundation to help direct the organization's educational and research activities. Now, for our second panelist, we have Dr. Manuel Cordero, who has been the executive director and CEO of the Hispanic Dental Association since 2018. His experiences have given him the knowledge and tools that helped him place the HDA as a beacon of hope and a roadway to success for all those who are engaged in providing and contributing to the improvement of both oral health and overall health of Hispanics as well as other underserved communities. And last but not least, our third panelist is Edward Salzberg, who is the lead research scientist at the Fitzhugh Mullen Institute for Health Workforce Equity and has been a national leader in health workforce research policies and data. Mr. Salzberg has successfully established and managed three health workforce research centers, and he was also the founding director of the National Center for Health Workforce Analysis at HHS. And now I'd like for um, our panelists to start by uh, giving their remarks. Do you want me to go ahead? I'd be yeah, sorry with you, Dr. Rios. Yeah, let me just start. So the National Hispanic Medical Association has been a longtime uh, supporter of diversity within all the health professions. We've had a scholarship program since 2004 for Latinos that are in graduate schools of medicine, dentistry, public health, nursing, uh, PA, and pharmacy. Uh, but we realized that we needed to do a deeper dive and we got a grant uh, for five years called the College Health Scholars Program uh, that was a research study to show that mentoring of Latino students that were pre-health students who wanted to go into medical school, dental school, nursing school, or graduate science uh, could really do 
better if they had mentor a mentor ahead of them. And we found out that the students really appreciated mentors who were maybe just uh, you know a few years older than them, not the professionals like us that are years ahead of them. Uh, and we also found out that they were very interested in having experiences like, for example, going to community college or going to a state school versus a big university. So the mentors, the mentoring that we did uh, was in California and in Texas and in the East Coast. Uh, and we had one, one, we reached about 2000 students, but let me just say that part of the students were in the intervention group that had mentoring and the other group, uh, control group did not get mentoring. On our website right now, we have the College Health Scholars Program and we have three buckets of information academic information on how to prepare and schedule your classes because you know we all know to get into medical school or dental school you have to have a lot of science classes uh, and then there's the professional development like how to say no to your to your boyfriend or girlfriend or your parents you know to go to dinner every Sunday night at home uh, and the third uh, bucket of information is financial resources because we all know that we come from families that are uh, low income or middle middle class at the at the most. Many of us do not have professionals in the family, parents that are professionals, unlike Indira, who know the importance of discipline, but also know the importance of how to get into college in, in this country. So let me just say that that's what we've been doing for, for quite a bit. We're, we're gonna be at our 30th anniversary next year. The other remark I'll say is that the importance of diversity in the health professions is so important you, you've already heard from the, uh, Indira and the speakers already that we need more uh, people to look like us. This country will be one out, one out of four Americans will be lat of Latino origin in the next 10 years, uh, 12 years by 1935 or 2035. And we know how important it is to start now. Now, let me just say the reason why we haven't gotten in is because there's so many different factors for admissions into college and then into medical school. And I'll just focus on medical school for the moment. Uh, one of the major factors is called legacy. It's the sons and daughters of the professors that get in first. And that's just natural because they know how to get in. They, have, they, ha they can get better letters of recommendation. They know how to study, they get better grades. But this country moved to holistic admissions to allow our leadership qualities and our our, what we call our asset model. We come from families that care for each other and know how to provide culturally competent language and not only in Spanish, but cultural competent uh, nonverbal communication, how to feel em empathetic with our families and patients. So there's a lot more than just numbers and grades that need to be part of admissions. And that's what's called holistic admissions, making sure you get some show that you're interested in health care, that you actually volunteered for health fairs or you went into research or, you know, as a college student, you showed that you have a strong uh, interest and that you're not going to just, you know, be a, a one night, whatever. But anyway, let me just say that um, we also have pro uh, the need for understanding that community college students can get into medical school and that there is pipeline efforts all the way through that we need to expand. Um, so what, what do we see as NHMA? We see this Congress, this is the year that the reauthorization of Title VII and Title VIII happens at, in the Public Health Service Act, which is the Health Resources and Services Administration's funding for mm -hmm. disadvantaged students to get into the health professions, all the health professions. And for Title VII, which is medicine, public health, dentistry, et cetera, uh, there is a new program that's being uh, supported by the Biden administration's fiscal year 24 uh, budget. And that's uh, supporting a diverse health workforce. It's going to allow $28 million for innovative approaches to recruit, support, and train new providers, jumpstarting a new health workforce uh, by building new medical schools, and I'm sure that means other health profession schools, by building new medical schools that are in underserved areas. And this is significant because the Supreme Court 
which is going to meet in June, is about to, we all believe, anticipate, right? We don't know for sure, but we anticipate that there will be an end to race-based admissions, which means we have to start thinking in terms of underserved communities. And uh, students from underserved backgrounds should be getting into schools in un, that serve underserved communities. And that's exactly what this new program is all about. So this would add to the Hispanic uh, serving institutions to be able to have a medical school that's already a Hispanic serving institution. Mm -hmm. And in fact, there is a bill by uh, Congressman Costa uh, expanding the Medical Education Act that allows medical schools to be built in underserved areas. And it's no uh, coincidence that he actually had the University of California Merced as his uh, flagship uh, idea, because in California, there's a whole movement right now to have the University of California develop UC Merced as the next medical school in California. And, and I'll just end here that California is the state in the country that has the most Hispanic students in mm -hmm. high school and college that end up going to medical schools in this country. And that's from the, the AAMC's data. And I believe that we need to push for a new medical school that could be a Hispanic focused medical school where their hospital would be in Fresno, California in the middle of farm worker areas. And uh, could be a real model for this country to have a major curriculum for uh, cultural competent, for all medical students that go would go there to learn how to take care of our communities better. So I'll, I'll just stop there. <laughs> thank you, Dr. Rios. Uh, thank you for your remarks. And you touched on a lot of important things that I'm really excited to get to uh, once we finished, uh, once the other panelists finished their remarks. Uh, so next, I'll pass it over to Dr. Manuel Cordero to give uh, a, a few remarks. Well, thank you very much, Indira. And I have to say that it is not only a pleasure, but it is an honor to be with this uh, panel of participants of, of Elena. When I first met Elena, I was completely mesmerized by her capacity, what she has done, and also by the fact that we're all talking about the same language, about health. Uh, people have the misconception that somehow in the industry and health are separate things. One cannot exist without the other. Uh, as you mentioned, I have been the executive director for the Hispanic Dental Association for the last four years. And um, it started out because I was actually involved in education all my life. I came to this country, as a matter of fact, to become a medical surgeon. That was what I wanted to be since I was eight years old. And I had the experience of coming here to go to college uh, for pre-med. And in my sophomore year, I had a toothache. And the school sent me to their local dentist in Bryn Mawr, Pennsylvania. I walk into that office and my life changed. I fell in love with a profession that I didn't know was so amazing and so inspiring and so life-changing to those that it affects. Uh, as a matter of fact, I modeled myself after that young dentist that was running that office within half an hour, all by himself with his knowledge, his equipment and, and his demeanor. He figured out what was wrong with me. He gave me instructions on how to prevent it. And he took care of my problem. And I said, this is the kind of medicine that I want to practice. All of a sudden I changed my mind from medical surgery to dental surgery. And uh, I couldn't have been happier because you know what? I didn't know this, but I think I was born to do the kind of work that a doctor in dental surgery does. Not only do we take care of the medical condition of those patients and the oral cavity, but also their self-being, their worth, their self-worth. We change people's lives, the way they look at, the, at themselves, the way they feel, the way they act. We heal the body and the soul at the same time. Um, the, 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 what led me into this position, by the way, was the fact that I dedicated my whole life to continuing education, not only for myself, but for those around me. And I spent the last 35 years working on helping other dentists become better. And one of the effects that I had was showing them the connection between dentistry and medicine, because one cannot exist without the other. I was actually part of the team, uh, I'm sure Dr. Uh, Rios was also part of this, uh, of the Surgeon General's report, 
on, on healthcare, which, by the way, for the first time in 2010, uh, oral health was included in it. And, uh, and as I was very, very fortunate to be also included in the second report that is actually uh, not quite the Surgeon General's report, it's another uh, report uh, from the government. Uh, the interesting thing is this, that we are realizing not only the shortage that we have, but the impact that our poor health percentages are affecting our underserved community. We don't, like you mentioned before, and so did Dr. Rios, we have a huge shortage in professionals in healthcare, both oral and systemic. We have a huge shortage. We cannot provide enough care for all the people that exist in this country. And I have been trying to inspire and get people involved in healthcare from the very beginning, ever since I got involved myself. Uh, one of the things that we have at the Hispanic Dental Association is a program that has been in existence for about at least 10 to 15 years, and it's called BOLD, Building Our Leaderships in Dentistry. And uh, one of the things that that program has been doing is like Dr. Rios mentioned about medicine, we are mentoring people into this career. Uh, I changed it a little bit because I believe that we need to go all the way down to elementary school. You cannot just look at the high school students, the middle school students. I believe that we need to talk to them when they can still dream. And that is when they're small children, when their minds are flexible and they can aspire to be. Uh, I do agree that uh, people respond better to the younger population. If I show up to a kindergarten class, by the way, I still do. And I still do have a positive impact because I love what I do so much that it's contagious. And they say, wow, this, look at this old man, how excited he is about being a dentist. Guess what? It's inspirational when you see somebody having done it for 40 years and still want to continue doing it. Uh, when, you, when you change people's lives and you affect how they feel about themselves on top of their health, I think it makes you realize the importance of who we are and what we are. Another thing that I am focusing on is decentralizing what it is that we talk about. I don't want them all to become dentists and doctors. I want them to become involved in healthcare at any level because every level of healthcare, you know, professionals is necessary. And we're not all doctors, you know? We can be proud of helping the system, of making it function, of being a receptionist, of being a technician, of being an assistant, of whatever it is that you want to be. What I don't want them to do is be limited. There are limitless opportunities, and everyone has a right to dream to the highest level they can achieve. My goal is to make every single person count and also appreciate it. Because let me tell you, I always say I wouldn't be half the dentist I am if I didn't have an assistant that was every bit as good as I am. My work reflects their work. And at least in my environment, uh, our environment is inclusive. We make sure that every single you know, team member is equally appreciated because it's a team. It's not what I do. It's like what we do as a unit. Those different healthcare professionals to me are equally, equally impactful and important. Um, I was very, very fortunate that when I started with the Hispanic Dental Association, one of the first years I had the pleasure of being Dr. Elena Rios. And Elena, it is, she's an amazing leader and an amazing human being. Um, and she was so kind because she embraced us. She embraced me, I know, the first time we met. And, uh, and we did a, a, an amazing uh, first, first meeting when we were actually giving lectures on the incorporation of both medicine into dentistry and dentistry into medicine, because it is interconnected. Every single patient that we see has something that they need from both of our parties. Sometimes they go to the physicians. The physician should know what things are important for them to identify so that those patients that need oral health care are sent to us and we, vice versa, should be in the same situation. Uh, we do have scholarships in place at the Hispanic Dental Association and also in our foundation. Um, and we are helping people at all levels. Like I said, we are not only giving scholarships to go to dental school, but to go to hygiene school, to dental assistant school, and so on and so forth. We really are concentrating on expanding this workforce issue, which by the way, 
I just found out in, in the meeting last week that dental assistants, for example, have decreased 42% after COVID, 42%. And we didn't have that many to begin with. That is a crisis in workforce issues. And, uh, and we are actually collaborating with different groups and entities to see how we can open up more programs to create more assistance. Listen to this, assistance. Imagine the doctors. We also have a huge shortage in doctors. I'm trying to reach every single dental school so that they can open their doors to more Hispanic students that are qualified. And not only that, specially qualified to treat the patients that are not being cared for right now. We're also trying to help the ones that are not Hispanics, but that would like to serve our, our communities by training them in Spanish, giving them lectures, you know, on how to develop, you know, their basic vocabulary in Spanish and communicate with those patients. Without good communication, there is not complete care. You know, one of the first things that you find when you go to, to a physician or to a dentist is you need to develop a sense of trust. And just as a simple word may just open the doors to that opportunity. So cultural competency is definitely a critical factor in providing healthcare for anyone. Um, dentistry and medicine, I think finally, and I think we're pioneers, by the way, Elena and, and I and, and our groups are pioneers in collaborating dentistry and medicine because we are doing this before anybody else was doing it. At least I don't remember another group of dentists and, and, and physicians working together like we have, and we're looking forward to doing even more. Uh, we're here. Thanks. We're here to, to empower, open eyes, and create more opportunities. And uh, and that's my goal. That's I think we're beginning to to make a difference. That's right. Thank you so much, Jose Cordero. And if anybody knows me, something that makes my heart happy. Um, is just meeting individuals in the healthcare field who are so passionate about what they do. And I remember really quickly last year when I met Dr. Cordero, um, who has a practice in, in his in uh, New Jersey. Um, he told me a year ago he was he was getting ready to to close it down. Um, and so now <laughs> fast forward to a year later, and he still hasn't done that. And what he told me is that it is because his community needs him, and it's hard for him to close it down. And so um, that's why we need to get more people through the pipeline so that Dr. Cordero is happy to hand it off to uh, somebody who will serve the community just as well. And so now uh, I will- That's what like, I am right now, by the way. This is, my, <laughs> this is my violent practice where I take care of my, well, my people. Yeah, yeah, I love that. Um, and so now uh, I will hand it over to Ed Salzberg to give his remarks. Thank you very much, Indira. It's a, been a pleasure uh, participating in this panel, and I really uh, love the enthusiasm and, and passion of, of Dr. Rios and Dr. Cordova. Um, as you mentioned at the outset, I'm at the Fitzhugh Mullen Institute for Health Workforce Equity at the George Washington University. Um, I, want to be clear that we're one of the few uh, organizations that are really dedicated to health workforce studies with the focus on equity. So we spend a lot of time doing studies. We look at um, uh, the data. We also do advocacy to support the individuals who are really promoting uh, the social mission of health professions education. Um, today, I want to talk about why it's so important, really give you just one data shot um, as my opening comments. Um, there are three big reasons why increasing the diversity of the health workforce is so important. People have touched on the first. We think it will contribute to improved health status by having concordance between the diversity and the background of the, the workforce and the popula population being served. So we think a diverse workforce will contribute to better health care. The, the second is the educational process. Studies have shown that having a diverse student body benefits all of the students. So having black and Hispanic medical students or dental students not only produces a diverse workforce, but it educates the other physicians and dentists and other professionals during that educational process. So there is a strong educational argument for a diverse student body. And the third is just improving access to well-paying, rewarding careers. Um, these are great, I think, help, being a health professional is a great opportunity and all our citizens should have that opportunity. 
Now, let me just show you some slide, uh, one slide about how are we doing. So on this slide, the blue line with the percent Hispanic, this is California uh, data. Um, the blue line and the number on the left of the blue line is the percent of graduates in California who are Hispanic. Um, and the blue line is 2010 through 12. And so in California, it was 20%. And then the, the, the arrow on the right is the, um, shows the direction of the change between 2010 and 12 and 2017, 19, and what the percentage of Hispanic graduates were in 2017, 19. And what you see there is it was 28% in 2017 through 2019. Um, really important is the line on the right, the red line, that's the percent of California individuals who are between the ages of 20 and 35. That's the, the age that people will be graduating and completing uh, health professions programs, some of which can be entered at the initial level and some of which um, require a doctoral level training. So the good news, and it is really good news, is that in 15 of the 16 professions we show, the representation of Latinos has increased pretty significantly in some of them. Um, and I looked at the uh, data, I didn't have a slide, the data for 2019 through 2021, and, and it continues to improve. So, um, you know, what you see in something like medicine, the, the Latino graduates in California grew from 9.6% to 12%, in dentistry, 7.5 to 12, in pharmacy, slight increase to 6%. So that's the good news. The representation of Latinos is increasing. But here's the sad news. There's no way close to parity to what they represent in terms of the percent of the population. So when I compare the diversity of the population, which in California in 2016 through 2020, 43%, 43.5% of the population were Hispanic. And so we could say, and we're happy to see that physicians went from 9.6 to 12, but we're nowhere near the 43% of the population that are Hispanic during 20 to 35. So this is a very mixed message, but I wanna focus on it's encouraging, we are making good progress. End the slide, thank you. Okay, that was that was the good news. We're making progress and we still have a long way to go. Here's, here's the bad news. The Supreme Court is expected to make a decision on whether you can consider race in any way, shape or form in admissions, um, college admissions. Based on their recent decisions of the court, no one is optimistic that they will continue to permit race consciousness in, in uh, admissions. Um, I really fear that this will set back efforts at diversity. Um, and so we've made, we're making progress, but we're facing a major challenge. The second major challenge we're facing is, and this is somewhat new and surprising, people really need to be aware of, that 17 states have leg had le legislation introduced this spring um, that would restrict the use of DEI efforts. Um, some cases they would uh, ban DEI offices at educational programs or ban mandatory training. Um, so we're really facing a, a pushback from many states um, that is uh, we really need to prepare for. Now, while I'm really worried about the Supreme Court decision, I really believe that there are examples, particularly in California, of things that can be done regardless of whether you can explicitly include race and ethnicity in admissions. Things like the pathway programs, the scholarship programs, the mentorship programs, we know it is possible. The reality is we really need to begin our efforts now. We are facing headwinds of the Supreme Court and state pushbacks. We need to continue to support efforts that will support a more diverse health workforce. I think that's, that's important, not only in terms of, as I said, for the care of the Latino population, but really for the quality of health care we have in America. Um, I would also note that um, for those of you who are interested in more data on where are we and how are we doing on diversity, that the Mullen Institute has a health workforce diversity tracker. It's an online interactive tool where you can get data on the diversity of the existing workforce and the diversity of the pipeline. It now covers 10 health professions, but 
We're going to re be releasing a new version in about two weeks that will cover 22 different health professions, has data nationally and data by state. I, I urge you to go to the website because it's so important in, in our efforts to promote diversity that we be data and fact driven and provide hard evidence to policymakers um, about the how are we doing and who is doing well. By the way, the data uh, on the Health Workforce Diversity Tracker actually has the data from the U.S. Education Department on the diversity graduates by school, every health profession, over 3,600 health professions, programs, and schools in the nation. So if you want to know how your school is doing or other school is doing, how your state is doing, please go to the diversity tracker. It's really designed to support those of us who are advocating for greater efforts around diversity. And let me stop there and welcome any questions. Thank you, Ed. Um, and now um, we are going to move to uh, to the question portion of this panel. Uh, but to get some, to give you some uh, time to think, I'm going to start asking the first question. Um, so, and this can be answered by any one of you. Um, and so, aside from legislative efforts, what are some efforts that could be done at the state or local levels to improve representation of Latinos? Any any specific example that come to mind? Yeah, the uh, the state of uh, California and Texas, because they did do away with race based admissions in 1996, both have done different things. Uh, in Texas, they allowed the top 10 percent of all the public high schools to get into college. Uh, Texas also has its own uh, medical school admissions application, which uh, gives, I, I'll say, uh, brownie points to the Texas students in colleges in Texas to get into their medical schools. So it's a way to help the Texas population by having more Texans stay in, in the state. What California did was change the admissions questionnaires to med I was on the admissions at UCLA Medical School when I was a fellow mm -hmm. uh, before this happened. And uh, I talked to people afterwards and they, they got rid of pictures so that you couldn't see if you were black, brown, white. Uh, and they also got rid of the questions asking about race, but they asked, tell us about your background. Where did you grow up? What kind of uh, uh, you know barriers did you have as a child? your family uh, income level, that kind of thing. Uh, and now we have, CDC has social vulnerability index. Uh, all of our communities are measured by, at the zip code level by poverty and education attainment uh, and other things uh, so that there is a way to compare where you grew up. And, and you know, you, we all know that the taxes in a community support the education and the public schools. So we see, you know, uh, less, less, uh, less funded schools with, uh, I'll say, less science courses, less science teachers in the lower income neighborhoods. So there's lots of things that have already been done uh, to show, to, to try to get the admissions to look at uh, Latino students and Black students, um, uh, you know, properly or more appropriately. I think the other thing that could be done is giving uh, funding to the Hispanic serving institutions. And I know that Dr. Raul Reese, Congressman Raul Reese, had a bill twice that he introduced uh, about the importance of the HSI funding from the Department of Education to actually have more mentoring and focused uh, STEM programs uh, that are uh, they, the Department of Education funds STEM programs, but not necessarily for careers, just for math and science classes. What we really need is focus on the importance of the health industry for all students to, to learn about the different types of jobs in the health industry, whether it's allied health or dentists or professionals like met doctors and dentists. Thank you. I think, I think there are a whole series of programs uh, that states can support. I mean, certainly uh, supporting the directly the institutions that serve uh, Hispanic and uh, other underrepresented populations um, would be is important. Scholarships are particularly important, and so income-based scholarships would be really valuable. Um, California just recently started a new exciting program, um, a clinical uh, California uh, 
medicine scholars program, which is trying to bridge community colleges with medical school and identifying students in community colleges who are interested and have the potential to go to medical school and providing support services. Community colleges, I think, as I think Dr. Rios has mentioned, a really important source of uh, educational opportunity that deserve uh, broad support in our communities. Um, some programs that um, also support the colleges can can take actions which the state could support, uh, including enriched uh, support mentorships for people who are accepted into school to improve retention and support students who do get into school. So there, there really are things that can be done. And I think um, some of the national associations like NGA, National Governors Association, are, are looking at uh, what can be done. And the AAMC is also uh, very active in this area. Talking about research and data that we need, uh, first of all, <laughs> Ed, thank you very much for offering um, access to your information, and I am going to be looking at it very, very, very soon. But I wanted to let you know that we have been looking at what is available in terms of new research on, uh, on data dealing with Hispanics in healthcare, and we found a desert of data. There's a lot of lack of data in mm -hmm. research. So we have created two new divisions in our, in our organization. Uh, we're only 33 years old. Well, guess what? In this last four years, we created a research you know, committee that has done first an analysis of the panorama in this country. What is it that exists? What is it that needs to be created? And what are the areas that we need to look at? So we have actually received a, a grant from KirkQuest that allowed us to spend a whole year you know, scanning the, the panorama, and we have found the weaknesses and we have found the areas of need. And now we're trying to break it down into sections so that we can address those needs. So we have our own research department. We have also our own uh, professional peer reviewed scientific journal, the first of its kind. It is a bilingual journal that focuses on Hispanic issues and our Hispanic uh, you know, professionally, because sometimes we also find that our people don't have access to publications like other professionals. So we're opening, opening rows in many ways so that we can not only allow our, our, our scientific community to be able to express themselves and be part of the system, but the issues that are, that are diverse. We are dealing right now, the last issue that we just, just uh, published as of yesterday, it's actually about our knee, our youth, our nuestros niños, nuestro futuro, which is really what is the, the true statement, a universal true statement. There is no tomorrow without education. Our children are the ones that are going to guide us through this process. Um, the job of the Hispanic Dental Association, I'm sure that, you know, Elena is in the same boat with me because we think alike, is exactly that. Let's reach out to the youth. Let's enable them, let's empower them, and let them realize that they are part of the solution and they are our future. So mm -hmm. our journal is, by the way, our journal has been read in 42 countries. We have 16,000 you know, views. We only started it last year. We only have seven issues out. When we are reaching all five continents, we are making a difference with the, the small size that we are we're taking giant steps. And I'll tell you, once you go a step forward, nobody can push you back. You just have another step to take. And, uh, mm -hmm. and that's what we're trying to do. By the way, we have professional and student chapters, both of which have empowered themselves with outreach you know, uh, activities where their main focus is affecting the communities that they're serving by instilling this, this uh, sense of, yes, we can. Yes, we can. You can be just like me, if not better. And uh, and we are. We're incre I'm, I'm like Elena, like I said, we don't talk about dentistry. We talk about healthcare. We talk about every single field because that's where it's needed. Everywhere. Everywhere. So a little bit at a time, we're going to make a difference there. Thank you, Doctor. Indira, yes. I want to jump in one other thought for state policymakers. Yes. Um, I think, and for federal as well, um, scholarships in return for service. Um, and many states have done loan repayment, but loan repayment requires someone to lay out a lot of money 
to go to medical or dental school or nursing programs. So um, support for scholarships in return for service is really a good, good strategy because it helps people access health careers, but also gets people into underserved areas to, to practice. So um, again, while I recognize it's, it's, there are good reasons why states might want to do loan repayment versus scholarship, but they really should consider also having scholarships uh, in return for service. 100%. Yeah, one, one other thing the states have done, I know New York did this uh, and California has done this and I'm sure other states, is they start with uh, seed programs uh, from very highly qualified students in science and math in high school and get them into college where they provide special training and mentoring, especially test taking, right, to get into graduate, uh, to uh, college. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then uh, allow them uh, into uh, uh, certain, uh, so many slots in, in college. I was at UCLA Medical School. UC Riverside did not have a medical school, had an undergrad program that brought in high school kids, and then they ended up at UCLA Medical School. There were placements already set aside for them. In New York, it was called the Sophie Davis program. And this was a, a city university. Again, these are state-based programs with state money to, to have special programs so that they can track students and those that are most qualified that, that they think can make it. And they get special programs mentoring. And what Sophie Davis did, the CUNY system got five different medical schools to allow the students in this special pathway program to get slots in five different medical schools. When they, and there was all for, uh, in New York, it was about underserved students. Uh, and they they were so successful, they decided to start their own medical school. <laughs> so wow. now there is a medical wow. school. The City University of New York has a medical school. Uh, and, uh, and that came from that program. Well, guess what? UC Riverside became a medical school too. Wow. Uh, and the Charles R. Drew University was also mm -hmm. another program uh, created to have underserved students, I'll just say disadvantaged students, that were 24 slots. They took away from the UCLA medical school class and they made them, um, they allowed them to go to UCLA for teaching uh, to, to learn their, their hardcore science classes the first two years. And then the last two years, they went to the Charles R. Drew campus where Martin Luther King Hospital is. And they had their now, so years later, and this all takes 20 years. Years later, the University of California got funded by the state to create Drew as a separate medical school. And they got, I don't know how many, $20 million or something uh, to be able to build their their building and to have a medical school now that'll be four years and they're accepting their first class this September of 60 some students. Wow. And we think the same thing can happen again for the Fresno area to have a training program there in a medical school that's in the Northern Central Valley of California uh, that would be at UC Merced and have the University of California actually build a new medical school where the students that, that come from that area would be most likely to, to stay in that area. So it's just mm -hmm. really remarkable what the states can do if they can keep the drum beat and keep planning and, and uh, keep getting funded, uh, you know, by the both Republicans and Democrats understanding the needs of our populations to have better health care. That's wonderful. And I'm really excited, especially as I mentioned earlier, um, I will be applying to medical school soon. So uh, I'm excited that this is an opportunity, not only for me to apply, but others who look like me. Um, and OK, so some of the questions that are coming in from the audience, um, this one is for Dr. Cordero uh, from Karima which uh, she's asking, I was really moved by your story, particularly the motivation behind your journey towards dentistry. What can we do as a community to inspire others to join the profession and expand how we show up in the marketplace? I believe the key issue is to remove barriers, mm -hmm. to make it available to everybody. And that's why I emphasize always the team 
you know, concept because we don't all have to be one particular thing. As a matter of fact, in dentistry, you, you're going to find something very interesting. There are a lot of people that started out as an assistant and fell in love with the profession so much that they said, no, I want more. And they become a hygienist. And then they got more involved and they want more. And from a hygiene, you know, uh, training point of view, which is only another two years, guess what? They say, I need more than this. I want to be the dentist. And I have met so many amazing dentists that started out as a dental assistant that I said, oh, my God, what a thought process. Imagine that. If you can plant that seed into everybody's mind, you don't have to stop at where you start. You just have to dream and think about what it is that makes you special. And that's how you grow. Uh, one of the, there's another part of our story in terms of uh, Hispanics, and that is we have a huge population. Like you mentioned, your parents were physicians in Mexico, okay? Just like your parents, there are so many from other Hispanic countries that are well qualified and well trained, but cannot practice here unless they revalidate their licenses. Well, I'm looking into programs that I can put together to use that knowledge to accelerate the process for them to relicense here without having to go through all this re-education in the high level mm -hmm. education you know, uh, institution because it is too expensive. You're talking about how can we make things easier? Well, guess what? If I can make uh, somebody who's a dentist or a physician in another country become a dental assistant, get an x-ray license and start getting more income with that simple license, an x-ray license, at least they're in the field and they can refocus their energy into becoming who they already are. They don't have to change careers. They just have to retrain. Uh, Ed mentioned something about how we can actually, you know, help repay our education through service. I am 100% behind that. I have spoken with different organizations, Dental Quest, Care Quest. They're all interested. You know why? Because it is a resource that we can utilize right away. We have capable people that are culturally competent that can be part of the solution. We don't have to be making these people struggle. The other thing that I'm talking about right now, especially because of the, what I just found out about the shortage in, in dental assistance, is to accelerate that process. You don't have to make a poor person, you know, go to a full year of training to be a dental assistant. You do not. You can teach them what they need to know in three months and be and you can also teach them to be an excellent dental assistant, not just a title. I don't want titles. I want knowledge. I want outcomes. The outcomes is what's going to make them hook and then want to do more. Because guess what? Knowledge is power. Knowledge, mm -hmm. education is the only, the only social equalizer that exists is education. And if we're going to be the majority of the people in this country, let's educate us. Let's make every single one of us count. I want people that when they hear a little accent, they look at us with admiration and with excitement because they say, whoa, this is another one. Another one getting educated to help our country. We're here to help this country. We're here to make it better. And we do it with our own knowledge, with our own hearts, and with our own hands. You know, we started this country many, many, many centuries ago. And we are continuing to develop it. And uh, when I see leaders, you know, like Ed and, and Lena and myself, I knew indeed that when I when I first met you, I remember how long I spent with your poster contest because <laughs> I was excited about it. I said, we need to work on this. We need to increase. I love this idea of the state funding specific projects that are helping Hispanics. And look how they take off because they see the value of it. I think we need to make that well known on other states to start. Do you know there are schools that don't even have chapters for the Dental Association, Hispanic Dental Association? I don't understand that. How can they not think that this is a necessity for them? How can they not think that they're missing out on something in the country when 40% are Hispanics? What's going on? Mm -hmm. It's lack of understanding, yeah. it's lack of knowledge. That's why the research department that we have in the Hispanic Dental Association was needed because we need to start spreading the news about what people don't know. First of all, we have resources here that are not being utilized and they're putting obstacles in our way, like, like they just mentioned, they're trying to eliminate you know, equity, inclusion, come on. 
we're making progress. Let's not move backwards. We're not crabs. We're human beings. We need mm -hmm. to make sure that we don't retrocede. We move forward and educate our population and the other population that don't understand who we are. I think it is. That's super great. Urban. Thank you, Dr. Cordero. Um, so I wish we had more than just one hour to solve the issue, <laughs> but unfortunately it won't be enough. So we'll have time for uh, about two more questions. Um, we do have some more questions coming in from the audience. We have one important one for Dr. Rios, uh, which I will get to in a second. But before we get to that question, I wanted to uh, quickly ask Ed to talk a little bit about um, when we did, you know, the, when we worked on the project together on this issue, um, we had some, uh, we came, to, we met some challenges on data collection. Um, how can we push for better data collection so we can examine fast factors that contribute to this lower presentation? And then can you talk a little bit about what Mullen, the Mullen Institute does, what kind of re, uh, data resources they use um, to, uh, to, to publish all the work that you, are, you all have been doing? Thank you, Indira. Um, we've been fortunate. We've relied heavily on the American uh, Community Survey, which is a census bureau that has data on race, ethnicity, uh, and a, a large you know, a large amount of data, and you can look at it by health profession. So you can say, and by you know state. So you know what percentage of the physicians in Tennessee are Hispanic? I mean, you you can get that data from the American Community Survey. The other big source of data we've been using is the uh, U.S. Education Department's Integrated Post Secondary Education Data Set. That people may not realize, but the U.S. government collects data on the diversity of uh, student bodies and graduates. The graduate data is by profession and by program, by degree. So that we, we use that to say across 22 professions now, you know, what is the diversity of the graduates in a, in a field? And so you can do it by school, by state. One of the big shortcomings of the data in terms of the, the Latino community is some of the data only collects Latino as one broad category. It's really important that the fact is, and you and I worked on the paper, uh, trying to look at the different uh, areas and countries of origin of the Latino community. Um, the Mexican American community is different than the, the Puerto Rican, the, the, the um, um, Cuban community and other Latino countries. So um, getting better data on the Latino subpopulations and the, the population is growing so rapidly and is such a significant part of the population that I think it really warrants more detailed data collection. Um, and so I think we can collect data through the licensure process, the education process to inform the, the community. I would, I would say that the Mullen Institute, we've gotten pretty good at slicing and dicing and analyzing this data. Um, one of the things we've developed is something we call the diversity index where we compare the diversity of the population to the diversity of the profession or the graduates. So you can compare across states and across schools by looking at their diversity index. Um, this is really important. I think I noticed a number of questions in the chat. I think it's a really opportunity for advocates um, to obtain better data to support their case. You, you, know, you wanna know how is your school doing? How does your school compare to others? How does your state compared to others. And with that information, go to the leadership in the state or the leadership at schools um, to really press them and say, why is our school in the bottom quintile of diversity um, when compared to our population? So um, we'd be happy to, Mullen Institute, we'd be happy to work with uh, advocates and educators, uh, awesome. learners who, who want to say, where can I get the data to understand how we are doing in our state and at our schools and our profession. Excellent. Thank you, thank you, Ed. Um, and then I will ask the last question to Dr. Rios, uh, from uh, someone from the audience who uh, who said, what can we do in the Central Valley, so the Fresno area, to ramp up the recruitment efforts? And this was referencing your, um, your comment about the additional medical schools. Well, the champion in the Central Valley is Assemblyman Arambula, who's actually a doctor, who's an Assemblyman Emergency Medicine doctor, who is the head of the budget committee for the uh, uh, health committee there in California, I think working with his office. The other thing is that we need to let uh, students know how important it is to connect to the 
Latino Center uh, there in Fresno, Dr. Kathy Flores, who was one of our board members and chair, chairwoman, uh, actually went to college with her. Uh, for the, she was a chairwoman for the National Hispanic Medical Association, has had a longstanding program there from uh, K through 12 to junior high to high school and to college. And she works with the University of California, San Francisco that has programs there for their medical students to actually go to Fresno and learn about uh, treating the Latino uh, community in Fresno, which is more rural area, like I said, farm worker area. Um, so there's, uh, I'm sure there's a lot of need for, for mentors, speakers, uh, and just all around support for the programs uh, that already exist in Fresno. And that's why there's such a focus on the need for a medical school funded by the University of California, you know, uh, for that area, for an underserved area. Perfect. Thank you, Dr. Rios. Mm -hmm. um, and thank you to the audience for your questions. But before we conclude, I'd like for the panelists to say one key takeaway that each of you would like to leave with our audience. And we can start with you, Dr. Rios. Well, I'll just say that the National Hispanic Medical Association welcomes uh, students to think about going into all the health careers. And on our website, which is www.nhmamd.org, we do have the College Health Scholars Program with lots of information about different careers and financial aid scholarships. So I would welcome students to come to our website uh, and we'd be happy to uh, uh, help you with mentoring. Uh, that is something that we wanted, we, we are continuing to have mentors for the students that are in college. Now we haven't gone down to the high school level uh, and, and Maybe Dr. Cordero is already at the high school level, but we, we just went to the college level to find students who are interested in math and science. And, and I saw one of the questions about STEM students. If you're good in math and science, you know, for any of the health careers, you need to have certain prerequisites to apply <clears throat> to professional schools and don't give up. And I know a lot of students get caught up in organic chemistry. That was the big problem, right? when we were applying to medical school, but there's ways to get tutoring and to learn how to uh, uh, attack these test taking skills. And you just need to, to be uh, able to, uh, to talk to your, your TAs, your, your, your teacher's assistants and your faculty. And uh, please don't give up because we really do need you. And whatever we can do to help, let us know. Uh, we're in Washington, D.C., and we're very interested in having uh, mentors around the country. We, we have chapters around the country, like the Hispanic mm -hmm. Dental Association, uh, and we're very interested in helping with the pre-health students, especially pre-med, but all the pre-health mm -hmm. students. Thank you. Thank you. Now I'll hand it off to Dr. Cordero for his closing I, remarks. I just want to say that uh, I really do believe in the power of everyone, because everyone has something to contribute. Uh, I have four children, by the way. Out of the four children, three are in dentistry. The one that said when she was five years old that she was going to be a dentist is not. She became a <laughs> statistician and a, and, a, and a consultant for Deloitte. She was the one that was supposed to, and she was the most caring, caring about the fellow men. She became a statistician. She loved numbers. But the other ones, guess what? One of my daughters is an artist. She's a sculptor. She's a painter. And one day she said, I'm sick and tired of hearing stories about teeth and people's mouth. I am <laughs> up to my, you know, and my daughter, my oldest daughter said to her, what are you talking about? We're talking about what you love, art, but we do it in the mouth. <laughs> you know, that night she went online. She's researched where there was a dental technology program going on. She drove from New Jersey to Pennsylvania, Lancaster, one and a half hours two days a week for a whole year to train. She was the only one that finished, graduated. She became certified. She worked for a major lab for three years and then taught in a school, in a dental school for five years. Now she's the head of prosthodontics at the VA in Philadelphia. And this is a girl that hated dentistry, right? <laughs> but she loved art. What I'm saying is every single talent that you have matters. It matters. She did not want to touch people's mouth, but she wanted to do the work that made those mouths work better. And you know what? 
this is amazing. We have opportunities for everyone. There is no one not good enough to be part of our community. And that's the message I want them to get. Everyone matters. Everyone counts. And let me tell you something. Nothing makes anyone happier than changing people's lives. And we do that every single day, one person at a time. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Cordero. Thank you. That was a beautiful story. Um, and now I'll hand it over to Ed. Thank you. Um, I think the, the most important takeaway message that I would give is that um, while the nation is making progress in terms of diversity of its workforce, we have a long way to go and we face many challenges. Um, you know, I mentioned the, the potential, the likely Supreme Court decision and state efforts against DEI initiatives. Um, we have to recognize that this is an uphill battle. And I hope that people uh, don't you know, recognize that we need to act now, not just wait till we get pushed back, but act in, in, in expectation that we're facing these, uh, these challenges. Um, and that the, the Mullen Institute uh, is, is welcome to, looks forward to working with others. Um, I'm sorry, I don't have a slide with the uh, the website, but it it's uh, www.gwhwi.org, um, or just put in the Mullen Institute, and you can look for the diversity tracker there, or write me at e Salzburg, um, um, e Salzburg at, at gw.edu, um, and happy to help with others. Anyway, there's a real um, struggle that we're going to be facing. I'm encouraged that. There are so many people that are committed to this, but we really need to work together collaboratively to make sure that we don't uh, take a step back and we continue to move forward. Excellent. Thank you. And with that, I'd like to say thank you to our panelists for taking the time to join us today and for enriching this important conversation with their expertise and lived experiences. We have a wide range of audience here, and whether or not you're currently working in the healthcare field, improving the representation of Latinos will benefit us all as we work to improve the health statuses of Latinos across the U.S. However, like I mentioned, this work will take cross-sector collaboration. Uh, but for now, we can start by joining efforts such as supporting existing legislation to diversify the health workforce. Uh, secondly, I'd like to uh, please invite you all to check out the NHMA and HDA uh, websites, as well as the Mullen Institute websites, and support their efforts. Uh, and for anyone in the field of research, please encourage better data collection so we can appropriate, appropriately identify where the underrepresentation is. And for those wanting to pursue a career in medicine, uh, please don't give up on achieving that dream. We have a challenging road ahead, but achieving being the first in your family to be a doctor and getting to be recognized as la doctora o el doctor del pueblo will be the greatest reward. And so thank you to the audience for your engagement and we hope that you are left inspired to continue this work with us. <laughs>